welcome to this scribbly lesson on She Dwelt Among the Untrodden Ways by William Wordsworth. It's a bit of a long title, but you'll notice that that title is also the first line, which is actually quite a common thing for older poetry to do, to just be titled after the first line. So this poem, it is older than a lot in the collection. So in some ways that means the language is a bit more inaccessible because it's just kind of old fashioned. Um, but I actually think it's one of the simpler poems in the collection. So don't let the language put you off. It should feel by the end of this lesson that, you know, it's quite a simple, obvious, clear poem for you. Having said that, you always need to get layers of analysis and interpretation to end up with kind of a high level in your essay. So with the really simple, straightforward poems that seem to have quite an obvious meaning, you still always need to go deeper and try and find multiple angles of interpretation or different alternative meanings and that kind of thing. So I'll give you some of those as well that you can use as we go along. So the very first thing we're going to do is just have a quick look at this vocab list. So a couple of um, words here, phrases, dwelt, kind of, it's a version of dwelled, which we still use nowadays. Um, and if you dwell, it means you live, basically. It's a, kind of like a dwelling as well as, as a house, basically, or some kind of place where people live. So dwell just means live. It can also sometimes mean um, to think. If you dwell on something, you're kind of thinking about it a lot and going back to it. So um, that's one way you can get an alternative or deeper interpretation. And there you can talk about the double meaning of that word dwelt to live but also to think kind of like your your brain is inhabiting a certain space <laughs> in your mind basically so either you're physically living in a place or your head is in a certain a certain space um made is a a sort of worker in this sense so obviously like made nowadays you might think of someone who works in a hotel maybe or a servant person um, because this is like a countryside poem, it's pastoral, as we'll look at in a minute. I think when he says made, he actually means kind of like a rural farm worker or someone who lives in the countryside rather than a servant of a house. So you, so even though you probably know what made means, I thought I'd just clarify that and um, yeah, and just kind of make it clear. So like a milkmaid or sometimes a maiden as well, like a maiden is kind of like a fair, beautiful, young girl, young lady. Um, fair, with that in mind, given that I just used that word. Again, another double meaning here, so it can mean what is fair, like what is right and honest, but it can also mean beautiful. So in a more old-fashioned sense, um, the meaning is like beautiful, so you might have heard of fair maidens in medieval times and that kind of thing. So you've got like a double meaning on that word and Shakespeare actually loves that word. So if you're studying Shakespeare, you'll probably notice whatever play you're doing that he messes around with the meaning of this word. For example, Macbeth, the first act, it says fair is foul and foul is fair and it's playing around with different meanings of fairness. So um, yeah, in this case, I think Wordsworth is also using it in that double sense. So she's kind of honest and a right, a rightful person, like she's got a kind of pure character but she's also very beautiful and those things are tied together.
kind of sad, but I think it's really crucial. So I feel like there's a bit of regret here, like maybe the speaker, who may or may not be words with himself, should have actually been more open and more kind of honest with his feelings. Maybe he loved her in a romantic sense. Maybe he only loved her as in he really appreciated her and wanted... Sorry, my dog. <laughs> wanted to be friends. Um, either way, he should have told her and he should have made her feel kind of happier about herself and, you know, um, and tried to connect. So it's a good message, really, for life that, um, you know, whether you romantically like someone or whether you just kind of want to be friends with someone probably a good idea to let them know how much you you love them or you appreciate them and you know kind of form positive relationships and positive connections throughout your life because random things can happen they might they might not even die they might just move away or something like that but um yeah it's important to to form those positive connections as someone who moves around loads myself and I still have really like my best friends from school are still my absolute best friends, I think. Um, and I've had years where I kind of go in and out of touch with them because one of them lives in Dubai and we don't see each other that much. Another one lives where I'm living now, but I didn't speak to him for ages because I was like living in Italy and Bristol and moving around. Um, yeah, and I've, it's actually quite hard when you, you have that type of life to definitely make sure that you stay in touch. But I try really hard to show that I appreciate them and we have a really good friendship and we really understand each other so yeah if you can connect poetry to your own life and be like okay how does this help me with my existence that's obviously a really good thing as well because it helps you internalize the ideas of it so try and connect it somehow to um you know just like i did then to to your own relationships or friendships that type of thing i think there's also this idea that um being beautiful doesn't have to be the same as being normal so there's a type of beauty, which is what we call conformist, which is like you see pictures of really beautiful people in the media and you're like, oh, I want to look like Rihanna or Beyonce or, um, you know, Nicole Kidman or I'm trying to think of like younger people that you might want to look like. I'm really bad with names. You'll know what I mean. If I just say think of a beautiful person, especially if you're a girl, because obviously this is talking about feminine beauty because it's centered around a female subject and um, there'll be people that pop in your head where you're like oh yeah they're beautiful I wish I looked more like them so that's kind of conformist because this is the way that we're told beauty is and we're kind of fed these images and we're told that is how you know we should expect to be or we should try and make ourselves more like them whereas one thing that's really um interesting and something that the speaker respects in this character Lucy is even though she doesn't have a strong, defiant character, something in her is personal and unique. And that beauty comes from her life being an expression of her personality. So it's not to do with just, you know, does she take a nice picture? Um, or does she have like her hair in a certain way or certain types of dresses? It's all to do with her character and how her life reflects her inner soul or her inner being um, and how she and her existence are all an expression of this unique personality that she has. So for me personally, again, with this attitude, um, I sort of struggle, like, honestly, with this one. Like, sometimes I'm like, yeah, I just wish I looked like whoever I think is nice looking this week or whatever in the in the media. And sometimes I'm like, you know, I'm just going to kind of embrace my weirdness and be a unique individual and kind of think of beauty in those terms. So, yeah, so it's like you can pick and choose. You don't always have to be one way or another. But I think it's a really nice positive message that um, beauty can come from uniqueness and individuality. And I do think that the most absolute um, beautifulest people ever in existence are always unique individuals. They're not people who just look like everyone else. So I would say that this type of beauty is actually ultimately more powerful, more difficult to achieve, but more powerful in the end. So if you're someone who struggles with concepts of beauty or kind of um, is, is undecided about that, it applies to uh, masculine as well as feminine beauty. So it's just to do with that, that idea of like, you know, being a kind of radiant person who exudes sort of 
positivity and I don't know like there's aesthetic beauty so physical appearance but there's also like inner beauty like your character shines through your appearance and so on so it's worth thinking about these regardless of whatever age you are in life whatever point you're at in life because they are just things like ideas that you come across in your daily existence um, and we can all choose to kind of have different attitudes on them or change our attitudes if we're more sensitive to the different options so this is a positive option that beauty is to do with uniqueness and individuality finally another nature attitude living in harmony with nature is like a perfect ideal thing to do and this is really crucial to Wordsworth as a person it comes up again and again in his poems um, he's what we call a romantic poet with a capital R which is different from just like love and marriage and whatever it's um, to do with nature and the harmony between nature and humanity and so on so he really thinks that the best kind of life we can live is one where we're really in harmony with nature and we're surrounded by the natural environment you may or may not agree with him depending on your personal preferences so that's something that you can get an extra layer out of like you can contrast modern people who live in the middle of London for example with people who live you know hundreds of years ago in the countryside and how our attitudes to life and our priorities might change I really love nature personally so I would agree with him that even even though I live right in the middle of a big city now um, I always just like go out into the countryside as much as I can and especially if I'm feeling stressed or like overwhelmed or anything as soon as I just go for a walk in a forest I feel better so um, yeah so I would totally agree with him but I know loads of people who you know they get nothing from that kind of <laughs> that kind of thing they have like other ways to spend their day so yeah think about you know how do you conceptualize nature what's your personal kind of experience and connection uh, experience of and connection with it so some techniques then we're going to have a look at now these aren't all the techniques but they're a good spread of them so probably these are enough I think to write a decent essay on sometimes I don't do enough and I say look at more but there's not like it's not a complex poem so I think if you just learn these I'll be fine for this one so the first one is metaphor she dwelt among untrodden ways this is both figurative and literal so literally she's living in a place which is not very trodden meaning there's not a lot of people around to kind of stand on the landscape and tread it down which means like she lives in the middle of nature away from uh, sort of in isolation from most of society but also again this idea of dwelt um, meaning if you dwell on something you're thinking on it a lot as well as you're living there we can get a more metaphorical interpretation so the literal interpretation is she lives in nature the metaphorical interpretation she lives a different kind of life her brain works differently from the average person and that's difficult for her in some ways but it's also very beautiful and very refreshing and very kind of uplifting and interesting for the speaker as well there's also this one a violet by a mossy stone and I've kind of gone into that one already so um, just feel free to look more at the notes if you need help with that one we have symbolism which is quite important so in a lot of poetry and a lot of literature things represent more than themselves they can represent a symbol so the star for example the reference to the star it, the lone star in the sky symbolizes independence but it could also symbolize loneliness like she's the only beautiful bright shining thing in this kind of dark world <laughs> it's very over the top romantic poetry so if you're kind of like listening to me going oh gosh it's so it's so like excessive and overly emotional that's just romantic poetry for you if you read it it's that's how it is i personally quite like it but i can totally appreciate that some people might think it's like way too soppy or over the, you know too far and um, so yeah it's just in keeping with romantic literature because that's the type of poet wordsworth is so yeah, so this star, it can symbolize loneliness and isolation. And there's this kind of old fashioned idea of being star-crossed as well. 
which again Shakespeare uses those. I just always compare to Shakespeare because most people study him, so um, that's why. And also he's awesome. But yeah, Starcross means you're kind of like ill-fated, like your fate is doomed somehow. And obviously that kind of relates to this girl because she's died too young, she's died kind of alone, she never married and had a family and so on. So it's sort of like unluckiness as well, maybe, the references to stars. Dove, the river Dove, is just the name of a river. And you can do a Google image search of that river as well to um, find kind of like a picture in your head of what it looks like where this girl lives. But as well as it being the name of a river, it's also a symbol because, um, yeah, doves are very strong symbols in literature. So they're, they're quite a Christian symbol, um, but they also symbolise peace and kind of harmony and unity, purity. Um, they're white, so they symbolise innocence as well. So there's a lot of different associations um, or connotations that we can get out of that word dove. So I'm going to skip visual imagery because it's again going more into the idea of dove. We have a simplistic and natural register. Register is the words that you choose to use um, in anything. <laughs> so we always speak in a register, but sometimes we're really aware of the register we're choosing. Sometimes it's just natural. So in this case, it's a very simplistic register. So he's deliberately choosing simple, pure words to copy the character of Lucy, to show her simple, pure character and to show that he treats her with dignity and respect and that he respects her personality as a simplistic but very beautiful being. There are several terms of address. So she's first called a maid and this is what we call an archetype. It's just like we just have a picture of a milkmaid in our head or whatever. So we just see her as like a standard maid. And then as the poem progresses, we get more of her personality we start to see her instead as a unique individual. This is another one of those double interpretations that you can do in an essay. So from archetype of maid into her individual name, Lucy. There's also quite a lot of negative phrasing to, I think, heighten the tragedy of the situation, the sadness that she's died so young and she didn't find love and kind of companionship before she died and so on. So none to praise, very few to love. It's quite a negative tone that is being created by those phrases. And it's quite ambiguous the whole way through whether he's talking about like family and friendships or he's talking about romantic relationships or both. So he's deliberately leaving that up to our interpretation. Maybe he's just talking about, you know, the very simple interpretation is he loved her, he never told her, now she's dead and he feels bad. <laughs> so you can read it that way. But you could read it more about social relationships in general and how to create like, you know, family and friendships around you that give you a good support network. So it can be either of those. Just a few things um, to finish off then. With the structure, I've kind of gone into this already, but it's just hyper regular. So when you're analyzing that, just look at how regular it is and think about why it's regular. It has this thing called alternate rhyme, which is an ABAB -A -B rhyme scheme. And I think any time a poet uses that rhyme, which I actually really like as a rhyme scheme, it sort of goes back and forth sound wise between two things. And hopefully you could see that when I was reading it. So what that means, I think you can interpret it differently if you wish. But my kind of interpretation is that he's basically going back and forth in his mind about this person or about the past and the present or about his kind of anxiety in terms of never actually revealing his true feelings or appreciation for this woman. So it's sort of going forwards and backwards in his head um, and it creates that rocking rhythm but it's also very soothing. So you could say it's like a lullaby or it's like something very simple and gentle, like maybe the you know flowing of a river, that type of thing. So you, you can get those 
positive interpretations and negative interpretations out of why he's chosen this alternate rhyme. And finally, the poem ends with an exclamatory sentence, the difference to me. This is the first time it uses the personal pronoun me. So the speaker is kind of like not really talking about himself at all until that very last word in the poem. So it's sort of like he's kind of been talking about himself all along, but he sort of wanted to suppress it and just talk about her. And eventually he ends up going back to like, actually, I feel really bad about this or I feel really sad. Maybe not many people cared that she was dead, but with me, it's, you know, it's devastating. And he's deeply moved and something very emotional about it. And that's the source of the poem. That's like why he feels he needs to even write the poem in the first place. So we've got some context points here just to finish off. Um, 1798, so basically almost 1800. Wordsworth was 28 at the time. Modern person, for a modern person, 28 is not old. I'm actually 29 now, so in my head I'm like, this is not old. But for someone of Wordsworth's time, this is kind of like middle age probably because people didn't live as long and, and so on. So he's not like a young man anymore. He would be considered like, you know, full, mature male. Um, there's, there's another poet that you're probably studying if you're doing the Cambridge one called Keats and he's super sad because he died when he's 26 but I'm always just in absolute shock about how he could write such amazing poetry by that age. I just don't, it's just like mind blowing because <laughs> I write poetry now but it's not like one day it might be maybe as good as like the worst Keats poem but for now it's, it's nowhere near as good as his. So yeah, always impressive. Um, so with Wordsworth, he wasn't really super famous as a poet at this time, but it, it, he was kind of getting there and um, he'd kind of committed to being a poet. He definitely established his main themes like nature, love, romanticism, that kind of thing. So yeah, you can go into Wordsworth and how he is at that age if you want to do some further reading on this poem. Um, as I was saying about this star, the name of that star is Venus, which is significant and symbolic as well. So it's the final star, uh, sorry, the first star to appear in the sky at night uh, before you can see the rest of them. So again, it emphasizes the idea of loneliness. Venus is also the goddess of love in Roman tradition and also Greek tradition, although she's called something different. So Venus refers to this idea of love. So I think that's a slightly hidden message that he didn't just want to be friends with her, he actually fully loved her and would have liked to marry her and so on. Not words with himself, but the speaker of the poem. The speaker is different from the poet. So, um, yeah, pastoral is another word I mentioned. This just means that it's a certain genre. It is drawing from the genre of pastoral poetry, which is all about the beauty of nature and the countryside and how perfect it is to live in the countryside and so on. So research the pastoral genre if you want some extra reading as well, because that will help you go deeper into this poem. Also romantic in terms of the capital R, so romantic literature is a different genre. Research that one too. Pastoral is like really sweet and perfect and romantic is more epic and emotional and kind of broken and tragic and all sorts of stuff so they're both nature but pastoral is like kind of sweet nice perfect nature and romantic's like crazy wild mental nature so you can see a little bit of both of those influences in this poem essentially Wordsworth is one of the six sort of romantic poets so we do call him romantic rather than pastoral if you want to just pick one of those it's also an elegy form. Elegy is a poem that commemorates the dead, so it, it's kind of a positive reflection on someone's life. And um, it's tragically elegiac, so he's really sad that they've died and it feels like it was a bit of a waste of their life as well. So finally, um, this is one of many different what we call Lucy poems. So this character appears quite a lot in his uh, in a series of poems between the, the date that this is published in 1801. So 
So it's kind of a character that he's using time and again, and this is just one of those many poems. So again, if you want to do any further reading, go into those poems and have a look at what the other ones are like and how she is as a character in those as well. So she might have been a real exact individual woman, but she might also just represent, you know, how femininity is to him or how women are, um, or the idea of beauty or that kind of thing. So she might not be real, she might be, and you want to just be sensitive to that when you're writing your essays. So as a final thing with this one, um, you can do a couple of exercises. I'm going to just write these here. So further reading would be um, romantic poetry, romantic genre, pastoral genre. Um, what else did I say to do? <laughs> uh, oh yeah, Lucy poems. So for further reading, have a look at that. And for themes, if you want to practice kind of looking at some themes and some messages behind the themes, um, you can come up with your own list. The ones that I interpret most importantly from this are death, uh, love, relationships, um, nature versus humans, and uh, beauty, probably. So they're my kind of key themes for this one. So yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this lesson. Like I say, it's not too difficult. So probably by this point you're like, yeah, I get this poem. It's not too bad, even though it's so old from ages ago. So yeah, thank you for listening. And I'm sure I'll see you in one of my other poetry classes soon.